Dr. Clifford Morden is a professor in botany at the University of Hawaii's School of Life Sciences and was recently appointed Garrett Parmile Wilder Chair in Botany. He was the past director of the Leon Arboretum on Oahu. His focus has been on conservation biology, evolution, and genetics of native Hawaiian plant populations. Dr. Morden provided a review of their plant conservation efforts and how the research they do has been important in the proper management of Hawaii's endangered plant species. He explained the history and formation of the Hawaiian Islands. He explained how birds, insects, plants, and mammals arrived in Hawaii only by wind, water, or birds. The focus of his talk was on the importance of taxonomy, the scientific naming of plants and animals, which is critical in correctly identifying species and determining if they are endangered. He explained two methods they use, DNA sequence alignment and population analysis, to correctly determine plants' taxonomy. He gave several examples of plant species that were incorrectly identified and needed to be placed in the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Aloha and welcome, everyone. Uh, we don't really have a guest that I see that we don't know uh, here or there. <laughs> uh, I'm Barbara Rogers, serving as president. It's a pleasure to meet you and uh, we have a wonderful speaker today. I think, do we have any announcements? Any particular announcements? We have the P PBX coming up. Yeah, PBX 24 in the Hawaii Convention Center. Yeah. That's October 2nd. I think we could use a few more volunteers, right? Yeah, we could use some volunteers for that. Yeah, to man our booth. Mm -hmm. And the volunteers get a, a voucher lunch. for parking, also for lunch. <clears throat> And you get a chance to see uh, and hear some of the seminars. I think they have about 16 seminars. And then also at the end, they have a Pauhana celebration. And it's just a gigantic, wonderful buffet. Okay, so let us know if you'd like to uh, help us out or if you know someone that might be interested. And now the best, one of the best uh, times of the meeting is to have Mac, come and hopefully give us a little bit of humor before we... <laughs> Architects and Engineers uh, Humor Corner here, which is pretty hard because uh, it seems like the world is crashing around us. So this is, this is a, an employee. <laughs> when I got to work this morning, my boss stormed up to me and said, you missed work yesterday, didn't you? And I said, not really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got that one right away, man. Yeah. I like that one. <laughs> so now uh, we will ask Sam to introduce our speaker for today. Clifford W. Morden. He's been a professor at the UH since... I got there in 92. And he's got a long list of assignments. Uh, he was educated at Brigham Young University in Botany and got his master's there and then went to Texas A&M uh, University in the Department of Range and Science in 1985. And he's recently been appointed Garrett Promile. I'm not really sure. Promile, I think. Promile Wilder chair in Botany in 2024. He can tell us what that is. And he's the director of the School of Life Sciences. And he's been a professor in the Department of Botany, Conservation of, Bi of Biology, Environmental Genetics. And he's also, on you know, his first visit here uh, in 2006, 2006, he was just appointed as the director of the Lion Arboretum, and which had been closed for a little while, and he opened it up again and got it running. And so I'm going to leave it there, and he can start our presentation. I'm going to talk more about uh, today some of the research I've been doing uh, and interactions I've had with the conservation community. So before I worked at Lion Arboretum, and 
uh, while there and afterwards, I've been, worked very closely with a number of the conservation organizations here in the state, and uh, in particular, the Plant Extinction Prevention Program, uh, which has been vital in terms of saving the rarest of the rare plants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a bit later. Uh, just to kind of give you some background, uh, we all know that the islands here came from volcanic origins. And so we're familiar with these sorts of scenes, as you can see here. So you can see some of these familiar scenes, lava erupting from uh, over at uh, Kilauea, Kohoi Hoi lava flow on top there, uh, covering up a road, and a -a lava flow on the lower road, uh, and then just a river of lava down below. So we're all familiar with these sorts of scenes here. One of the things that we don't often think about is how the origin and the demise of a volcano takes place. So there's a uh, eight or nine steps that it usually goes through, and you can see them here. Um, so from the first uh, emergence of the volcano out of the ocean, uh, you have the building phase, uh, which is uh, like number two right there, which is where Kilauea and Mauna Loa are at right now. Uh, you have uh, subsidence or, or where it starts to sink down. As you can see in three, it goes through a rejuvenation period, which is like Mauna Kea right now with the cinder cones all over the top of the mountain. Uh, and then it starts to erode. And so the rest of the islands, Maui, uh, Molokai, Oahu, uh, Kauai, are in the more degradation part, erosion phase, like in step five, until eventually you have the buildup of uh, the uh, coral reefs around the side of it, and you have just a little tiny spit of land that may be sticking out at the top, uh, like Nihoa, Necker, and Gardner Pinnacle in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, and eventually, uh, all that all that is left is just an atoll, like you see here. But you can still see the mountain down below that. So this is uh, representing the mountain that's down below the atoll. So just some pictures of what we were just talking about. So at the top right, or top left, excuse me, you see uh, Mount Akea, Mount Aloha. You can see the cinder cones up on top. And this mountain is only about uh, less, less than a half a million years old. So it's... Um, didn't really take that long to get to that point. Uh, the other islands that are fairly eroded, like you can see here on Kauai, uh, about five million years old. And then when it's uh, an atoll, like you see here at Laysan, uh, which is about 20 million years old. So it's a, a fairly rapid, geologically speaking, process to go from one extreme to the other. Uh, this is a look at the Hawaiian islands, the uh, whole archipelago. All the islands come from a hot spot, which is located right here, uh, just off of Kil off the coast of Kilauea on the Big Island. Um, and so that's where the source for all the lava is at. Uh, but you can see it's spread out way up to the northeast, and that, that's because the conveyor belt of the uh, tectonic plate is shifting at about nine centimeters per year to the northeast. So uh, if you've been in the same bedroom for, uh, say, the past 20 years, you've shifted about, what, 20 times nine centimeters uh, to the northeast from where you originally started at. And mm -hmm. although you don't really, we don't really notice that per se. And then here you can see the entirety of the ocean chain. Uh, so we're looking at just these islands here, which are the high islands right now, and then the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which extend to about 35 million years uh, as the last atoll that is, uh, that is above water. Um, and then uh, from there, it extends up to submerged atolls all the way up to Manji Seamount, which is about 70 million years of age. Before humans came to the islands, there were a lot of really diverse uh, plants and animals that were here. Uh, this is a artist's rendition of some of the things that we have seen right, from either fossil records or past collections or, or so forth. Um, one of the interesting ones is this right here, the Moanalu, which is a giant duck that was about two feet tall. It was flightless, could not fly. Um, and uh, it probably went extinct shortly after Polynesians settled in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, you also see an ibis uh, and, and a number of forest birds, which 
are historically known here, but um, have many have gone extinct uh, since then. Uh, there's a variety of different habitats around the islands, and we're all familiar with most of these. Uh, the coastal zone, this is out of Kaena Point, over on the uh, northeast side of, of uh, Oahu. Uh, you get up higher, this is uh, an example of a dryland forest. Uh, this is over in Kohala district of the Big Island, looking down from the Kauai uh, shrubland uh, that occurs up there. Um, and also where there's more moisture, you get rainforests. At the top of a lot of the mountains, we have bogs. Uh, so this is at the top of Mount Ka'ala, where the vegetation is uh, growing in saturated soil. So the soil or the roots don't get much oxygen, so they don't grow very tall at all. Uh, these, so these are fully mature trees. And when you get them off of the, or just outside the bog, they grow to full height of which could be 20 to 30 meters tall. So they can get quite, quite large, but they're stunted here in this bog. Going higher elevation, we have uh, subalpine shrublands. So these are high enough that they're above the clouds uh, over on Maui and the Big Island. Um, and uh, so you don't get enough vegetation to grow a lot of uh, tall trees or enough moisture to grow tall trees. And then going even higher than that, you can get up to the Alpine area, uh, which is an Alpine stone desert. It's very dry up there. And only a few plants can survive, uh, such as the silver sword, which is shown here. So a wide variety of different habitats that plants have evolved into. And where did these plants come from? Pretty much all over the place. Uh, they couldn't come directly from a continent. So we have only things that could come here either floating through the water or uh, through getting caught in airstreams by the winds or being uh, carried by birds uh, or other flying animals that could come here as well. Uh, so uh, just kind of focusing on that, there's lots of different birds that have arrived here uh, either directly or they've gotten caught up into uh, wind systems, uh, hurricanes and things like that, blown off course and then they landed here and started new populations. Uh, so here is showing a couple examples of an uh, ocean bird, an uh, albatross, as well as an EEB, a forest bird. Uh, insects came by a variety of different ways, but mostly they were blown here in wind patterns. And so uh, just an example here of, the, of a happy face spider uh, that has radiated into a number of different kinds of forms and, and so forth. Uh, mammals don't travel very well. So the only mammals that could get here are those that could swim, like the monk seal, or those that could fly, like the hoary bat. And so we only have two native mammals here to the islands, and that's, that's why. Uh, plants, of course, uh, have lots of other options. They can come either by wind, being blown here by the, uh, by the airways, or getting carried by a bird, or getting float or pushed across the ocean by uh, waves action. And so a lot of times it's referred to, uh, to as wind, wing, and waves uh, for the transportation of plants to the islands. One of the things that's been really fascinating about studying plants and animals here in the islands is the concept of adaptive radiation. So the radiation is where you have a single colonist that has radiated into a multitude of different species. Um, the adaptive part is where they gone into different habitats and they adapt to that particular uh, type of a setting. So some have adapted to very dry, high elevation, low elevation, wet uh, conditions, and so forth. Uh, so this is a, a great example in the plant kingdom. Uh, the Hawaiian silver sword is probably one of the best studied examples of an adaptive radiation for plants. Had a single colonization uh, which has led to three genera, and each of the three genera is represented here. Uh, you can see the silver sword itself right here. This is a, a with five, and there's five species in that genus. Uh, and then in the middle, we have Wilksia, where there are two species, uh, both of them only on Kauai. And then the last ad adaptation, or the last genus, is 
Uh, on the right, we have uh, Dubaudia, which has 27 species that have radiated in that. And there are uh, some that are adapted to Mount, uh, Mount White Ali Ali over in Kauai, the wettest spot on earth. And that's the plant on the bottom. Uh, and then uh, in other places, trees, forest trees. And there's also lianas and various sized shrubs and some of them extremely dry habitats and others very wet habitats. To give you an example of this, uh, adaptation, each of the lines going across here represents a different species, and you can see the initials which uh, account for it. So like that top left one is DA, which is Dubaudia arborea. Um, and uh, But you can see here the adaptation that these species have really gone through in a variety of different habitats. The graph on the left is showing the average or the mean annual rainfall that takes place in the habitats that where these occur. Uh, yeah, you can see some of these things in very dry habitats, less than 100 centimeters of rain per year, maybe down to about 30 or 40 centimeters of rain per year, which is only you know, about a foot of rain, very, very little, to extremely wet sites, like on the top of Mount Waiali Ali on Kauai, where they get like 4,000 or 4 meters of rain per year. Um, Elevation-wise, similarly, uh, you have some at very low elevation and some at very high elevation, like the silver soil that occurs at about 9,000 feet or 3,000 meters elevation, very high elevation. So great example of adaptive radiation. And this is looking at some of the leaf variation that we have uh, across all these different species. So for instance, these would be uh, of the silver sword. These are just various species of Dubaudia uh, that uh, very tiny leaves to very big leaves, depending on their habitat and their, their needs. Uh, similar types of things with the birds. This is an adaptive radiation of forest birds, uh, just a single colonization, which led to 47 different species and only a handful of them here are shown. Uh, people talk about the adaptation of Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the diversity and the visual spectacle of them, they don't compare with the Hawaiian finches that we have here that are in this radiation. Um, you know, the vast color plumage mm -hmm. differences, mm -hmm. uh, the beak shapes, uh, and the types of foods that they eat, uh, all are very characteristic of, of this. Probably the biggest radiation that we probably don't think about often is with our Hawaiian Drosophila, the fruit fly that's native to the island. Um, and so we often refer to them to, as the picture wing flies, uh, as you can see up here, because the wing diversity that is present within them is just incredible. Um, this is, uh, here you can see some uh, examples of the whole fly. They're much bigger than the like Drosophila melanogaster that we often think about as a fruit fly. Uh, these are probably about 10 to 15 times larger than the Drosophila melanogaster. Um, the other thing that's fascinating about this is from a single colonization, they figure there are probably about 800 species of Drosophilids that have evolved in all the different habitats around the island. Uh, they've named about 600, and there's about two or 300 that they have yet to name yet. They have them, they just haven't named them. So it takes a lot of time and process to, to do all that. Uh, me being a botanist, I'm going to focus on plants. And so um, just to give you some statistics on the diversity of plants that we have here, there are 82 plant families represented with 214 genera. Uh, about a thousand species altogether that have come to the islands, 90% uh, of which are only found in Hawaii. And so that's what endemic means. They're only found here. About 10% of our plant species are indigenous, which means they have been, they're found here as well as elsewhere. Uh, and fascinatingly enough, they're, they've come from about uh, 264 separate colonizations to account for these over a thousand species, though a lot of speciation has taken place. There's a number of colonists that have arrived and they haven't changed. They're the same species here as, uh, you know, different from elsewhere, but they're still the same species, one species across all the islands. Uh, and many, but there's a number of different genera that have radiated into quite a few different species.
Um, I mentioned that uh, the different ways that uh, the plants have gotten here by wind, water, or wing. Uh, about 1% of the plants have come here by wind. Uh, Metrosideros polymorpha or the Oeoleua has little tiny windborne seeds that are blown across uh, blown long distances. A lot of our coastal plants are well adapted to dispersal by water and they came uh, through wave. But most plants, about 75% of all the plant species came by uh, some way attached to birds or internally eaten by birds. And so uh, a lot of different, um, most of the diversity that we have here is from that. Where they come from, you name it, everywhere. Uh, plants from, come from all over the rim of the Pacific. We also have plants that their most recent ancestor is in Africa. So uh, not many, but a few. And so just a lot of really diverse uh, ways that plants have, have gotten here as well as where they've come from. This is just kind of recapping a little bit about uh, the plants themselves. Uh, so just kind of, again, emphasizing that about a number of a thousand species of flowering plants that occur here, um, they're in trouble. Uh, they're, uh, we have a lot of uh, issues that are making the populations decline. And as a consequence, uh, Hawaii is regarded as the endangered species capital of the world because of that. Uh, we have 104 of these thousand species that have gone extinct. About 500 of, of them are extremely rare uh, and endangered. 366 are endangered, listed as endangered by the Hawaiian, or excuse me, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, 260 of them are PEP plants. And I want to emphasize PEP, uh, which stands for Plant Extinction Prevention. It's a program that we run here at the university. Uh, and we have staff on all the different islands. I'll talk more about that in a second. But to be considered a PEP plant, it has to have fewer than 50 individuals remaining in the wild. So very, very rare. Uh, and just to kind of emphasize that, this is looking at a, a graph showing the relationship of the number of species that are rare, endangered versus uh, those that are not, which is about half and half. And here's a graph that depicts how rare some of these populations and species are. So just to emphasize, we have about 20 different species. So this is the number of species along the left axis. This is the number of individuals that are present within populations. And we have about 20 species where there are no individuals left in the wild. They are only known in botanical gardens and, and oh. facilities. Uh, we have about, um, about 70 different species where there are between one and 25 individuals in the wild. And so it's, it's hard to fathom how rare that is. Um, you know, we, we see so many things so commonly, but these are things that uh, people have to really get into remote areas to, to find them. Um, so I mentioned that we do have lots of rare species, endangered species. Here are a few examples of them, and a lot of them are really pretty really pretty flowers and, and interesting growing plants. Um, and uh, so these are uh, all species that are considered pep plants. You can also see the habitats are pretty remote. So they're up in very deep mountains or at the top of ridges and, and on some of them hanging on cliffs and so forth. So they're often, yeah, like you can see the this one here, uh, this is a Brigamia, which only grows on sea cliffs over on on Molokai and on Kauai, uh, and it's, it's ex extinct from Kauai now also. But we work closely with the PEP program, and uh, they do a number of different things around all the different states. We have uh, staff members on each of the main islands, Molokai, Maui, the Big Island, uh, Oahu, as well as Kauai. Uh, and they spend almost their whole week either working in the field or hiking into remote places or getting helicoptered into more remote places um, to either uh, collect, collect seeds uh, or fruit from them or to protect them by building fences around them or surveying for new plants that might be in the area, outplanting into protected areas, 
and then going back and monitoring populations to see what the status of those populations might be. I'm very happy to know that I, I work closely with the PET program. We do a lot of good work and they, as managers of these areas, they often have questions about what this species is or what that species is, is it really distinct from these other species? Uh, should we be protecting it? Should we not be protecting it? <clears throat> and so that has created an opportunity for a number of different research things that I've done over the past uh, 20 or 30 years. And one of the big questions is the taxonomy of them. What is taxonomy is the classification or putting a name with an organism. And so it's important to have a good taxonomy for a variety of different reasons. Uh, there are the unit of conservation, that's what we protect. Uh, we need to communicate information about the species. Uh, we need to have a, a name that other people will, will recognize. Uh, it helps us understand the biology. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to uh, measure the taxonomic richness of a particular habitat. And from a legislative perspective, you can't protect something unless you know what the name is. And uh, so that's always very important. From a conservation perspective though, one of the most critical things that I find is that bad taxonomy can kill. Uh, this is the, an issue of the journal Nature back in 1990 when this uh, saying first came up. And uh, it was with the tuatara, which is a lizard that's extremely rare down in New Zealand. And it was growing on some rocky outcrops or living uh, on some out rocky outcrops off the coast. And they had found that, uh, or they had thought before that it was just one species on all the little islets. And then somebody went and did taxonomy of it, careful taxonomy, and he showed that on this one islet, it was a completely different species. It was really rare. It was different than everything else. And so, hey, we need to protect this. And so, hence, bad taxonomy can kill because if you don't protect those things, that species could very easily go extinct. So in the work that I do with our plants is I take uh, generally a, a two-pronged approach to looking at them. Uh, one is that we look at DNA sequences. Uh, we look at one individual for, from each population uh, of the species that we're working with, as well as related species, so we can put it into a proper framework. Um, and then we also do population analyses, and that's where we look at a multitude of individuals from each population. Uh, in some cases, every individual from uh, the population that we're working with. So to give you some examples of how this works, uh, this is a sequence analysis of the genus Rubus, which is the blackberry raspberry genus. And so we have all these different species here uh, that we've sequenced this one gene for. It's the tail end of a gene. These are the amino acids that uh, define it, that uh, the bar there indicates the stop codon where the, the protein stops. And then this is a space in between this gene and the neighboring gene. And so we align the sequences for each individual so that they can, they can be compared. And we can see some interesting differences and so forth here. Uh, in this particular study, we were interested in these two species, Rubus hawaiiensis, and Rubus macrayi, because they're the two species that are native to Hawaii. And so we wanted to compare those to everything else. Uh, this is the what's called a phylogeny of it. It's sort of like a family tree. And if you think of it as a tree, turn it kind of sideways so that it's so that this part is at the base, and then these are the leaves at the very top of the tree. So that's uh, the easiest way to kind of show it. It's easier to depict graphically uh, sideways like this though. Um, and so you can see here that you have a big cluster of species that are grouped up here, another cluster of species that are grouped down here. The two Hawaiian species are not closely related to each other as was previously thought. And so uh, we were able to demonstrate that very clearly here that the one species, Rubus hawaiiensis, is related to the salmonberry of the Pacific Northwest. And then the other species, Macrayi, is related to uh, Rubus ursinus, which is actually a blackberry. 
So they're not just not closely related, they're distantly related to each other. For a population analysis, we do things a little bit differently. We run some genetic tests, we run them on gels, and we get this banding pattern that you can see here where every lane here uh, vertically is a different individual. And so then you can compare side by side the different gene region and if it's present or absent in this particular plant. For example, here, uh, every other individual has that gene region except this individual. And so we do that for each of these lines going across, because uh, they all represent uh, different gene regions going across. And then we score it either a zero for absent or a one for present. And then we put it into a data matrix and after we have it in this data matrix, we run statistical tests on it so we can visualize it. And here's an example of a visualization of that kind of data. This is looking at different populations of a, a species that grows out at Kaena Point, um, the Euphorbia celestroides, celestroides uh, variety Kainana. And you can see all these different little populations they are all labeled in different colors and shapes and so forth so that we can see how they're related to each other. Okay, so that's kind of the background for getting into uh, what I'm gonna show you. Uh, we have uh, a few different problems that I'll show you. First with Hesperomania. Uh, this is a genus that is endemic to the islands. It only occurs here. Uh, it's on three different islands, Kauai, Oahu, and Maui Nui complex. So Maui, uh, Molokai, and Lanai. But the taxonomy is really odd. You have one species that is found on Oahu and Maui, another species that is on Oahu, Lanai, and Molokai. And people that were studying this, they just couldn't figure it out. It didn't make sense to them. And so uh, we started to look at this from our perspective and try to figure out why. Uh, this is what the plant looks like. It occurs up at higher elevations on the mountains. Um, and uh, this is arborescence from what was over, over in the Ko'olau Mountains. Uh, this is arbuscula from the Waianae Mountains. Uh, and you can see the, uh, it has a little bit different look to the leaves as well. And this is Ligatii from Kauai. And so uh, the growth pattern of it and so forth is quite a bit different. We looked at the um, individuals. We did a sequence analysis of it, uh, looked at the phylogeny of individuals um, across the popular, across the islands, and then we also did a population analysis of it as well, uh, of multiple individuals. And so here you can see this is the phylogeny that we produced, the tree, and you can see here, like, uh, you have a very well-supported cluster of all the plants from Molokai and Maui together. And then here's a big cluster of all the Oahu plants. And closely related to that are these plants from Kauai. Okay, it's nice to get these island differences, but the taxonomy is really messed up because you can see here with this group, you have Arbuscula down here from Molokai and Arbuscula up here from oh, the Waianae Mountains. And they're not together. If they were the same species, they should be together. Uh, the same thing for arborescence from Maui and arborescence from the Ko'olam Mountains. So based on these studies, we knew that something was up. We had to, we had to change things and fix things. This is what uh, the, the new taxonomy of it looks like. Uh, we have the arborescence from Maui Nui all together. Uh, so this is Molokai Maui together. Uh, Lidgadii from Kauai, all the Oahu plants. We have two clusters. Oahuensis from the Waianae Mountains and Sweezii from uh, the Kokolaus. Those were renamed? Yeah, so we changed the names of them so it would reflect their evolution. Exactly. This is looking at the population variation of it. Every spot you see there is a different individual. And in some cases, it's every individual known of that species uh, that was then. Uh, and so these are the blue ones up here are all the Kauai. Uh, individuals. The red are all the Oahu individuals, and the green are all the Maui Nui individuals. So again, very cleanly, the different island groups are separating out, 
We looked at the Oahu plants a little bit more closely, and we can see that there's a big separation between the Waianae plants and the squares. Uh, the different colors represent the different populations, and the circles, which are over here on the left, which are all the Koala Mountain plants. And so again, uh, based on this evidence, we named these Oahu insis. We went back to an older name that somebody had applied before everything got lumped together. And uh, same thing here, this is uh, Hesperomania sweezii um, instead of uh, arborescens, which is only found on Maui. The result of this is that we changed things from, uh, we, we're now recognizing four species, uh, three of them are only found on a single island, as you can see there. Uh, one from Kauai, uh, Suizii only on Oahu, and Oahu insists only on, uh, also on Oahu. Arborescens is on Molokai and Maui, but only from those two islands. Uh, what's really critical from this perspective is that three of these are PEP species. And in particular, Oahu ensis, which was lumped with the Maui and Molokai plants before, uh, has a new name only for it. It's designated as a di distinct species. And of all these species, that is the one that is most critically rare. All of them are PEP species, all three of them. But for the but for our, our Oahu ensis, it is down to only less than 10 individuals known in the wild. Uh, at the time, we did sample about 30 individuals, which was all that was present, but many of them have, have since died. Again, a critical example of how bad taxonomy could have killed that species because it wouldn't have had the protection needed to, to save it. Uh, we have a similar situation with this genus. This is Cryptocaria, uh, which is uh, a species which is it's a large genus worldwide but we only have two, one species that was recognized on Oahu or on, in the islands. We have uh, Manii, which is known from uh, Kauai and Oahu. On Kauai, it's really abundant. On Oahu, there was only one plant. And so we looked at that more closely. They did have some morphological differences between them, but, but uh, not enough to, by consideration of some people, to name them separately. This is what the plant looks like. It, it's in the uh, avocado family, so it looks very similar to avocado plants. Here's one with fruit on it. So it, again, it looks like a little tiny avocado, about uh, two inches in diameter. Um, so we did similar types of steps to collect things. We had uh, somebody helped us collect all the different populations on Kauai. We visited the one plant on Oahu, and then we did more sequencing and, and uh, population analysis. Here's our sequence analysis. You can see all of the Kauai plants, they cluster very clearly together. Uh, and then here's the one Oahu plant, uh, very distinct from it. Uh, this number here represents the percentage of support for this particular branching structure. So this is 100% supported by our statistical tests. Uh, down below, we had a, another sequence analysis. And again, it showed, we only had one each and it, it showed that they were distinct, but not, not as distinct. When we looked at the populations of it, um, we again saw vast differences between them. Uh, this is the one individual from Oahu. These are all the individuals way down here uh, from Kauai. So based on this, we were able to demonstrate that yes, uh, again, we could we need to save this one individual. It is now recognized as a distinct species. It's Cryptocaria oahuensis, distinct from Cryptocaria manii, uh, and it's now considered a pet plant with only the one individual remaining in the Waianae Mountains. Uh, they've done quite a bit of work. They've got some seeds to germinate and, and done some air layers and things like that to get more individuals. Um, with mixed results. The third problem, which uh, is something that just came up this year, and we uh, just finished up this study and uh, we got it uh, published recently. Um, we were looking at two species over that occur on the Big Island, uh, Portulaca villosa, which occurs across all the islands, and Portulaca sclerocarpa, which only occurs at high elevation on the Big Island. 
uh, has a very minor difference between them in the fruit wall thickness. And, you know, if you look at a, a grapefruit, you know, like a store-bought grapefruit, which has a thin wall, and then the current local grown ones, which, you know, the thick the <coughs> thing is about an inch wide. So that could be a very variable character, not very great one, but uh, that's what was used taxonomically to differentiate between them. Uh, we have the two species down below here, on the, on, and so you can see how they look very similar to each other. One of the characteristics of both species is they have these really long hairs that are associated with the branches of them. Uh, they're called villus hairs, and that's where the name for that one species come from, Portulaca villosa, uh, has these, these hairs. But the other species has those as well. So again, we did uh, extensive population analysis across all the different islands. We did sequence analysis, and I'll show you the results of that, which is uh, pretty minor. Um, but uh, we did comparison of uh, a, a lot, as many individuals as we could. From the sequence analysis that we, we looked at, we didn't see any differences between the species. Um, we did find some population differences. Uh, we analyzed every individual that we had for this one gene region, it's called the ITS region. And this one region of the sequence that we have right there, you can see that uh, this one, from all the plants from Nihoa have that extra GGT right there, which is missing in all the other populations. So not taxonomic to distinguish these two species, but it, it's kind of interesting from a, uh, another perspective. When we looked at the, all the individuals at the population as population markers, we again saw uh, similarly all the Nihoa plants uh, come out separately from all the rest of the plants. But most interestingly, all these circles represent sclerocarpa and all the triangles represent, and even up here, represent villosa. And so they are different from each other at this, uh, as this shows, uh, separated from left to right on this particular graph. We took that a little further and we looked at just the big island plants. And so they're color coded here as well. So that you can again see all the plants that, uh, of sclerocarpa, which are distinct from all the plants of villosa. Uh, at, the, at the population level. And you can see that the populations generally kind of cluster close together to each other here. Uh, but uh, again, each species is distinct from each other. And I'll be honest, this really shocked me because I thought the two species were going to be the same thing. And uh, you know, when we got this result and we, and we found this, I was, I, was, I was really pleasantly surprised. So the results are that they are two distinct species uh, the past taxonomy, not all past taxonomy was bad. Some of it was good, uh, as this showed. Uh, and uh, what's also promising is that sclerocarpa will continue to get good protection as an endangered species moving forward. That kind of brings me to the end of everything. I just have one take-home message that I wanted to leave with you, and that's that proper taxonomy is important for understanding the biology of the species, but also for, for the proper management of a species. This is especially critical if you're working with endangered species, as we often do now. Uh, and uh, what's also fascinating is that there are so many different tools now that we have available with molecular biology and, and so forth that we can look at things more closely than we ever could before. And uh, so it's it's a great time to be doing science. Yeah, thank you. Now, time for a couple questions. I'll be the lead off. Where where does your funding come from? A variety of different places. Uh, we get state funding, uh, some federal funding. Uh, I I don't currently have an NSF grant, but I have in the past National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for these kind of things, a lot of it comes from the state and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Just a note of thanks for this uh, underappreciated but critical contribution to uh, Hawaii's future. Um, Thank you. How few, Thanks. very few people know any, anything about this and uh, Anything we can do to help spread the word, please let us know. Also, thank you for the contribution you've made to uh, lion 
Arboretum. Is that open to the public now? Yes, it is. I think the hours have changed considerably since I worked there. At one point, it was even open on weekends, uh, but they stopped doing that. Um, I They prefer, if you do go there, to do it by appointment, so call and, and uh, make a reservation to go. But uh, yeah, it's, it's open to people. Good to know that that's once again available. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We have a certificate here for you. Oh, great. As our tradition, we may have, we should have another one. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> that was a very comprehensive talk. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, you you're welcome. It was fun to put it all together. <laughs> so. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comment on this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com. <music>